and therefore will the Lord wait, that he may be gracious to you, and therefore will he be exalted, that he may have mercy upon you. For the Lord is a God of judgment. Blessed are all they that wait for him. Isaiah 30 verse 18 The people were in a great hurry to be delivered from their enemies. The Assyrians had come up in great force and were covering the land with their armies. They had already devastated the neighboring kingdom of Israel. And therefore the men of Judah were afraid that they would be swallowed up quick. Even as dry stubble is devoured of the fire, the prophet bade the inhabitants of Jerusalem remain where they were, adding, For thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, In returning and rest shall you be saved, in quietness and in confidence shall be your strength. But they would not listen to the counsel of wisdom. They preferred to follow the suggestion of their fears and to go down into Egypt for shelter. They were impatient because they were unbelieving. They were slow to obey, but they were swift to rebel. Hence the Lord cries to them by his prophet, Woe to the rebellious children that take counsel, but not of me. They sent their princes as ambassadors to Zoan to entreat aid from the Egyptian king. Yea, they sent a great treasure upon camels as a bribe to Pharaoh to espouse their cause against Assyria. They would not rely upon their God, and so they looked to the land of the viper and the fiery flying serpent, and were stung with bitter disappointment, for vapor and emptiness were the help of Egypt. It seems as if the motto of the people then was, We will flee upon horses, we will ride upon the swift, Again and again he urged them to be quiet, saying, Your strength is to sit still. But they would not learn that rash haste is but ill speed. They could not be quiet by reason of their fear and folly. But the Lord waited, and turned not from his long-enduring patience. In the words of our text, he showed that if mortals could not wait, yet their Maker could. Therefore, will the Lord wait, that he may be gracious to you? And he assured them yet again, that if they would learn to wait, they would find it their wisdom and happiness, for blessed are all they that wait for him. Here is the subject of this morning's discourse. Certain of God's people are in trouble and distress, and they are eager for immediate rescue. They cannot wait God's time, nor exercise submission to his will. He will surely deliver them in due season, but they cannot tarry till the hour comes. Like children, they snatch at unripe fruit. To everything there is a season, and a time to every purpose under the heaven. But their one season is a present. They cannot, they will not wait. They must have their desire instantaneously fulfilled, or else they are ready to take wrong means of attaining it. If in poverty, they are in haste to be rich, and they shall not long be innocent. If under reproach, their heart ferments towards revenge, they would sooner rush under the guidance of Satan into some questionable policy than in childlike simplicity trust in the Lord and do good. It must not be so with you, my brethren. You must learn a better way. I hope that the sermon of this morning may go some way, by God's Spirit, towards instructing you in the holy art of waiting for the Lord. Those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. The text divides itself in two parts. First, it introduces us to a waiting God. And then secondly, it speaks of awaiting people. First, we have here, awaiting God. I shall not confine our illustration of this waiting on the part of God to the case of the men of Judah described in the text. But I shall come home to your own experience and speak of how the Lord has waited that he might be gracious to you. 
let us behold as long-suffering towards ourselves. In so doing, we shall not be leaving the scripture, for the text as truly describes our own experience as that of the men of Isaiah's day. The word of the Lord, which is now to be considered, opens first with a wonderful reason for waiting. And therefore will the Lord wait. Therefore. Mark the word. The Lord Jehovah does as he wills both in heaven and earth. And his ways are past finding out. But he never acts unreasonably. He does not tell us his reasons. But he has them. For he acts according to the counsel of his will. God has his therefores. And these are the most forcible kind. Full often his therefores are the very reverse of ours. That which is an argument with us may be no argument with God. And that which is a reason with him might seem to be a reason in the opposite direction to us. For what is there in this chapter that can be made into a therefore? Therefore will the Lord wait. Whence does he derive the argument? Assuredly, it is a reason based on his own grace and not on the merit of man. The chapter contains a denunciation of the false confidences of the people, and because of these one might have concluded that the Lord would cast them off forever. If they will have Egypt to lean upon, let them lean on Egypt, till like a spirit pierces their side. God might well say, Let them alone. They are given to their idols. Instead of what he cries, Therefore will the Lord wait. He will let them see the result of their carnal confidences. He will allow them time in which to test and try Egypt, and see whether Egypt is not a boaster whose help is to no purpose. Do you not remember when it was so with you? Perhaps you began your religious life with the great mistake of hoping to find salvation in your own goodness. You looked to your feelings, prayers, doings, and professions for safety. You thought that your deliverance must come from yourself, and so you sought to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, without remembering that it is God that works in us to will and to do of his own good pleasure. You knew nothing of God's grace. You thought much of your own good works. So many prayers and tears. So many church goings or chapel goings. So much of sacraments, almsgivings and the like. And this would make up a sweet-smelling sacrifice acceptable to God. Blessed be the Lord who had great patience with you. He had told you plainly enough beforehand that by the works of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, and you ought not to have tried that forbidden way. But as you would try it, he allowed you to run in it, till a gulf opened before you. You worked out the plan of self-salvation, and the net result was bitter disappointment. You saw that you could not keep the law. And you felt also that if you did keep it, your obedience would make no recompense for the sins of the past. You perceived that the wrath of God with your righteous due, an abyss yawned before you. You did not dare go further, neither could you trust the sandy ground upon which you stood. You were in great distress of mind. And it was for this that the Lord had in mercy waited. I heard some time ago of a man who let out horses and carriages. A person wished to hire one, and having heard the price, he went round the little town to all persons in that line of business to get something cheaper. But, as he did not succeed, he returned to the first person and said he would hire his horse and carriage. No, said the other, I'm not going to let you have it. I know why you have come to me. You have been round everywhere else. And if you could have saved a shilling, you would not have come to me. I do not commend the tradesman, but I do not much wonder at his conduct. See how much more patience there is in God than in man. We refuse his free salvation, and go round by way of our own merits, and everywhere else, to try and find some other ground of confidence, 
And then at last, when everything is broken down, we come back to God and the salvation through Jesus Christ, and yet we find the Lord lovingly waiting, graciously waiting, a God ready to pardon. Further, these people were rebels against God, and the Lord was waiting to let them fully manifest their rebellious spirit and be made ashamed of it. The chapter begins that way. Woe to the rebellious children. Further on, he calls them a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord. Was that a reason for waiting to be gracious? Yes. With the Lord, sin shows a need of grace, and so becomes a reason for grace. The Lord allowed the people to show their rebellious character, to let all mankind know what kind of people God had to deal with, and that they might in after days have the higher admiration of his long-suffering and of his grace. I think the Lord permits many sinners to go to the full length of their tether in order that they may know in the future what stuff they are made of and may never trust in themselves. Those who, from their youth up, have been under restraint, do not know the evil of their own hearts, and are apt to think that they can scarcely be heirs of wrath even as others. But those who have developed their innate depravity by actual sin dare not dream such proud falsehoods, for their actual sins would cry them down if they did so. When the Lord leaves us to ourselves a while and just stands back and lets us have our spin, what pretty creatures we are, Ah, oh, me, it makes us blush to remember it all. In after years, we have to bemoan ourselves and to distrust ourselves and to admire the measureless bounty of the grace which chose us and would not alter his choice, notwithstanding all our untowardness. A strange, therefore, is God's therefore. Therefore will the Lord wait that he may be gracious, that the abundant display of the sin within the man may lead to a more thorough and hearty confession of its fault, and to a greater admiration of the splendor of the grace which puts that sin away. The Lord would wait again for yet another season, namely to let them suffer somewhat of the effect of their sin. He permitted them to send their ambassadors to Egypt that they might come back disappointed, and he allowed the Assyrians to devastate the land, that they might feel the pinch of famine, and learn that it is an evil and a bitter thing to forsake the living God. It has a purifying effect upon men to let them bathe in the bitter waters, which flow from the foul fountain of their iniquity. It is well that they should see what kind of serpent is hatched from the egg of evil. Perhaps some of us were left in the same way, and we shall never forget what we thus learned. We were allowed to go on in sin, and we did so until we began to feel the result of it, and now we flee from it with horror. We put our hand into the fire until it was burned, and now we dread the fire, the quittance of self, the abhorrence of sin, the clinging to the Lord which comes out of our miseries, are all precious. And therefore does the Lord wait to be gracious, wait until we set a just value upon that grace, and have a due horror of the sin from which it delivers us. Again, I do not doubt that the Lord waited in this case to be gracious until the people should begin to pray for that seems to be the turning point in this affair. The prophet says, He will be very gracious to you at the voice of your cry. When he shall hear it, he will answer you. The Lord is listening for the sinner's prayer. How is it that you have not prayed long before, a troubled spirit? Why have those lips been dumb for years? What? With all your sense of sin, 
and with a clear idea of the misery that will come of it. Have you yet refused to pray? Then you may well wonder that the Lord should wait. It is a marvel that she should have any patience with a prayerless soul. The open display of its grace in your soul in the form of pardon sin will not appear to you until it is said, Behold, he prays. Wherefore, then, are you so slow to cry to him? If mercy is to be had for the asking, what shall become of the man who never asks? If God says, Only acknowledge your transgressions, what must be the fate of him who will not acknowledge his transgressions? If the Lord sets mercy's door before us and writes over it, Knock, and it shall be opened to you, how can we be excused if we do not knock at once? And yet such was my condition once, and such was yours. My brethren in Christ, we did not feel the guilt of our sin. We would not own that we had erred. We did not recognize the misery that sin brought upon us. We did not pray. We did not seek the Lord through Jesus Christ. Yet, all that long while, the Lord of mercy waited that he might be gracious to us. And the reason why he should have exercised such forbearance and long suffering is hard to see until we look into the goodness of his heart, until we see in the bowels of his compassion the deep fountains of love from which rivers of mercy flow. Behold, the heart of God yearns towards his people. Was it ever more clearly seen? than in his long forbearance, his waiting to be gracious to us. This leads us to notice in the second place a singular patience of God in that waiting. What does it mean when we are told that the Lord waits, that he may have mercy upon us? It means that he kept back the sword of justice. It is inevitable that where there is evil, God shall be angry with it. It is not a matter of arbitrariness with him, but it is inevitable that the judge of all the earth should take vengeance upon evil and wrong. God must punish sin. This is one of the fixed and settled principles of his very existence. Here the attribute of long-suffering patience comes in and spares the guilty from time to time, giving room for repentance. Justice waits a while that love may try her hand and bring the rebel to a better mind. With some of us, the Lord must have drawn the sword right out of the scabbard, and yet he sent it back again into the sheath, bidding it be quiet a little longer. With some of us, the Lord must have lifted up the axe to cut us down, for we have been such cumberers of the ground. And yet his mercy has stayed as justice, and the axe has been laid by all for mercy's sake. Because of the intercession of the Lord Jesus, the Lord has let the lifted thunderbolt drop. And here we are, still the living, the living, I trust, to adore our long-suffering God. There are some dear friends before me who must forever highly honor the forbearance of God in sparing them. Through so many years of sin, till at last their gray heads bowed before his grace. It could have been easy enough for God to have destroyed them when they were running riot in their youth. I easier to destroy them than to spare them. Have not some of you been in positions where, if you had been killed, it would have seemed only according to the order of nature that you should be? but your being spared was a miracle of providence, a special interposition of goodness. The brand and the fire will be consumed by being let alone. But if it is to escape, it must be plucked from the burning. Well then, bless a God who waited and held back the punishment that was due to you. Bless the Lord who was so slow to call you to account who postponed the day of trial. I initiated a reprieve to let you live when you were condemned already. This patience of God also. However, then delay in punishment, it seems to be the continuance of privileges. 
for the Lord told his people that, although he might give them the bread of adversity and the water of affliction on account of their sins, yet he would not take away their teachers from them any more. They should still be instructed and warned and invited to come to him. Now, if God were to send a word of mercy to a man once, and that man willfully refused his message, it would be perfectly just on God's part if he had said, I will never send another ambassador. It was condescension on my part to invite this rebel to be at peace with me, and since he declines to do so, he has made his choice of war, and surely I will contend with him and he has made his bed, so shall he lie on it. As he prefers to be my enemy, so let him be to his own destruction. Ah, me, how long does mercy linger? How earnestly she pleads with men to be kind to themselves, instead of hasty wrath against his people when they were rejecting his word. The Lord sent prophet after prophet to them, and when they stoned one, and slew another, he even sent his own son, saying, They will reverence my son. Still did the heralds of salvation cry, Turn ye, turn ye, why will you die? Has it not been so with some of us? We heard the gospel when we were quite young, and we have continued to hear it till we were quite old. So patient is the Lord. It may be that I speak to some who have continued to hear that gospel every Sabbath day and have determinedly refused it throughout a long life. Shall it continue to be so? Dare we always provoke the Lord? Still the white flag is hung out, and the silver trumpet knows no note but mercy, mercy, mercy. Oh, that man would hear that note and turn to the Lord. Oh, my brethren, the man who loves not the Lord Jesus is already anathema, maranatha. All holy intelligences say amen to his being held accursed, and yet the Lord permits him to tread his courts and hear his word and gives him space in which to repent of his evil deeds. He waits that he may be gracious to you. Therefore he bids his ministers wait upon you in hope and proclaim to you over and over again the loving kindness of the Lord. So singular was God's patience that he even increased his holy agencies to lead the people to himself. He says, Thine ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying, This is the way. Walk ye in it. Do we not remember how when their public ministry seemed to miss us, we began to be bestirred by an inward force more powerful than visible ministries. Conscience cried aloud and accused us from within the doors. I remember well when it dogged my heels wherever I went. It would not be at peace with me until I was at peace with God. Do you not remember in your own case when it began to be very hard to sin? The drags were clapped on, and you could not gallop down the hill as you wished to do. You found it hard to kick with naked feet against the sharp pricks of your conscience. You found it difficult to go to hell. You had to leap, fence, and rail, and ditch, and you were tired of such steeplechasing. The voice of Jesus from without seemed echoed from within. You could hardly tell whence the voice came, but it was always following and crying, This is the way, walk ye in it. Oh, the devices of infinite love! What patience was shown by the Lord to send this inward monitor! Why did he not say, Tell Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. Though we had Moses and the prophets, the scriptures to read, in the gospel to hear, yet he added to all this a still small boy. In addition to a summons from without, he added a pleader within. Did we contend against even this? Alas, we did. 
for we seem determined to destroy ourselves. Behold what manner of patience the Lord has exercised towards us according to the abundance of his grace. Nay, this is not all. For all this while God was passing by our rejections of him, blotting out our sinful refusals and insulting despising of his goodness. You know how it would be even with your own child if you were to say to him, My child, I am ready to forgive you if you will confess your fault. If he would not acknowledge that he was wrong, but held out stubbornly, you might have considerable patience, but I question if that patience would last for days and weeks. Your rod would soon be spoken with. Men that have been very famous for bearing insults have at last been compelled in vindication of their own honor to put an end to the provocation. How grievously far have you and I carried our insults of God? Do I not speak to some who are carrying the provocation a long way? Even now, you will not accept the Son of God by whom alone you can be saved. To save you, it was needful that Jesus should die, but you trample on his blood. It was not possible for you to enter heaven unless the Lord Jesus should be your substitute and bear your sin. And you have heard all about that wonderful truth, and have yet acted as if it were nothing to you. You have not believed on Jesus. You have rejected the Father's testimony concerning him, and resisted the witness of the Spirit of God. This you have done for many a day. The tear has started to your eye, but you have wiped it away, and it is gone as the dew of the morning disappears in the heat of the sun. You have at times been driven to your chamber and to your knees, but you have forgotten your hurried prayer. And again the dog has returned to its vomit, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. This cannot last always. Men cannot always thrust their finger into God's eye at this rate. The wonder is that it has lasted so long. Please remember that all this while God has been waiting, but everything has been ready, ready for the sinner to come to him. Listen to the divine word. My oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. Alas, they would not come. So it is with us, who are now brought to enjoy the provisions of grace. And so it is with many who are still outside the banquet hall. They do despite unto the love and mercy of God and the provision of his boundless grace. Of multitudes, Jesus says sorrowfully, He will not come unto me that he might have life. I wish I could better set forth the singular waiting of the Lord, and he may have mercy upon us. But I pray the Holy Spirit to bless my feeble utterances to all that hear me this day.